Punk. Well, do ya? It's time for another episode of Lucky Time Explosion! Wow! <laughs> pew, 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 pew. Welcome back, everybody. It's Friday! It's finally! We're getting out of here soon for the weekend. And we have a very special couple of guests this week. We've got Swoon in the house and Mariah, or M-O-R, stencil art. More. So two incredible uh, street <laughs> artists and cutters extraordinaires. All you three guys, of us. All three of you. All three of us. We're all I'm the odd duck out today, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. You gotta get I, your knife game up. Oh, I get do, with the I program, do. kid. <laughs> <laughs> we got the analog versus the digital. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're yeah. outnumbered. Yeah. <laughs> VR man. Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, for listeners who might not uh, know of who Soon is, uh, one of the first female artists to be recognized internationally uh, in street art uh, and has done a lot of amazing projects over the years, which we'll talk a little bit about today. How are you? Yeah, I'm really good. This is fun. Nice. It's nice to be in the room with you guys. Nice yeah. to reconnect with more. Yeah, totally. So uh, tell us a little bit about your beginnings. I know that I read uh, I read a little bit on your wiki uh, about how you went to an old folks home uh, and, and take lessons oh, yeah. from like... Bob Ross. <laughs> yeah. Was it Bob Ross himself? <laughs> no, it wasn't Bob Ross himself. But yeah, that was where I started. That was where I got very serious about painting. Yeah. It was in Florida at this like retired folks like painting class and they just like fully adopted me they awesome. were like you have to give it your all you're here i would never be painting for like six hours a day and you were like 10 right? like 10 with like inhaling all these oil paint fumes and coming out with this painting oh. and being like i did it <laughs> but I, yeah, I really awesome. feel it's like instructive like every kid should get that kind of self-esteem boost because mm. like my teacher painted half my painting oh, yeah. but then everyone thought i was a genius and then i was like okay <laughs> <laughs> I actually had a teacher growing up who would paint on your work, and I always thought it was funny because in this class, she would go around and be like, this isn't right, and she would adjust on yeah. it. And I was like, thank you. That's why I'm here. But a lot No, of not me. Real. I would paint over it. I'd be like, nah, <laughs> yeah. I did it. <laughs> a lot of people were like, no, this is my art. You've ruined my masterpiece. Yeah. Yeah. So I, me and um, Moore met at Con Artist Collective, which is also kind of known for street art. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you, and it's been like a developing thing. It is fairly recent in art history, right? The, the branching off between like graffiti and street art. What does street art mean to you? Like, how do you define it? Since you get labeled it all the time. Are you asking me? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Or either of you. Feel free to jump in. I mean, gosh, it's been such a practice over the years. I always was one of the artists in that kind of genre that was most interested in all the ways that people were thinking about that. Like all mm -hmm. my friends, you know, and I haven't even actually really been uh, that heavily involved in street art in many years now. But like when I was, I was always like my favorite friends were the like people who were like, oh, I'm building like this weird house in the subway tunnel or like, you know, I'm, I'm like hanging swings from like under a bridge. Like people yeah. who are like, OK, we're working with the city and we're creating these kind of like public facing artworks and these kind of renegade interventions, yeah. but it, it really can take any form. It's just kind of about this sort of public kind of like actions. Yeah. Your work's always, uh, you're always described as having um, a big connection to the community and having activism and um, community visibility be a big role in your work. Mm -hmm. um, like how do you think art can help? <laughs> like, you know, how does art change the world for you? How, I, I know. Yeah. I'm thinking mainly about you, maybe your tile project yeah. where you were giving, you were providing some jobs for the local community. This I mean, there's so many different ways. Right. Yeah. But I do, I, I do feel in a way like I am kind of a concrete thinker. Yeah. Like I'm always, <clears throat> I'm always going like, okay, we're making these things. And then I always feel like art is like this active ingredient that you kind of need into the dough of life. And you're mm -hmm. like, okay, here's a situation. How can we take this, this thing that we do oftentimes with our hands, but also, you know, oftentimes organizing or just, thinking about a problem differently and to be like, how can we bring this set of skills and like m massage it into this situation that needs like that much more energy, that much more problem solving, that much more joy, beauty, mm. any of those things, you know? And so 
I've done that like in many different instances, like from Haiti after the earthquake to Braddock, where where folks were like, uh, you know, all these buildings were getting bulldozed and there was so much kind of loss of economy. And people were saying, like, are there things that artists can do in these moments to not only like save these structures, but also to like create alternatives. And like the cool thing, I love that project because we, we, I worked on it for over 15 years yeah, it was and a like, long time. it was a very long and it had many different iterations. And now it's in the process of becoming housing for, for women and families coming out of prison. Oh wow! And it's, we are uh, turning it over to a leader in the community. So it was like this kind of very long process of like letting, letting it evolve the whole time, you know? That's super cool. Very cool. How did you two meet? <clears throat> um, how did we meet? Oh, well, I remember. I think it was at, um, I think we met at, you gave like a talk at like an Apple thing That's or something. Right. Uh-huh. And so somebody asked a question and I looked at oh, I think her shirt, shirt and yeah. I was like, that is cool. And then I just got a feeling and I was like, did you make that? And you were like, yeah. And we I had kind of like, that oh, we got recognition. <laughs> um, is that the shirt? Oh, no. this is just a shirt. I just do this all the time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, well, I had like, I think I had recently like quit bartending. I think mm. I was like 25. I had like gotten fired from a job. I was trying to take my work seriously and making masks and like, I don't know. I just had this feeling that I wanted to like go in a different direction. Um, and I remembered being like, I feel like I have to like go meet Swoon today. I just feel like I have to go do that. <laughs> and I cut out this like little horseshoe crab and I was like, I feel like I just have to give her like this little red horseshoe crab. I just feel like I have to do it. Mm. Um, and then we ended up talking and then I ended up working for you. After that, that thing is great. amazing. Thank too. you. It's so beautiful. I have it on my wall still. Um, um, you two have a very um, similar, uh, like, you know, there, there you can see influence there. And sure. I think it's a, uh, pretty awesome it's yeah. like very cool and in the long traditions of paper cutting like every yes. every Absolutely. culture in the world has paper cutting and i think it's tradition. something that's often been women and it's been deeply rooted in craft and like things that are deeply rooted in craft they've often been diminished because women mm-hmm. have done them mm-hmm. um but i think that like kind of like that like ephemeral quality of paper mm-hmm. i love it's mm-hmm. so incredibly like delicate yeah um but it's also so versatile and mm-hmm. it's so simple and i just love the idea of just having like a blade and paper and negative and positive yeah, space that's it <laughs> um, speaking of uh, women being diminished you know i often hear uh the art world being described as like a boys club. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I, I've i not had that personal experience. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's the level I'm at. Maybe it's just the friends around. Maybe I'm just not a dick. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but uh, what do you guys have any experiences of that? Like any instances where, you know, kind of felt like you were being uh, pushed aside in favor of someone else because of um, your gender? I don't know. I mean, I feel like, well, we've obviously had like incredibly different careers. But um, I don't know. I mean, part of the reason I only use M-O-R is just because I never wanted – not that I didn't want people to expect that I was a woman, but I kind of mm. like the idea that they wouldn't know. So I'd show up for stuff and people would be like, oh. Do you want me to bleep out when I accidentally said your name in the oh, beginning? Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> I mean, I, it's like, it's, I, I don't often use it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that like, I think on the one hand, there's kind of great power in it because sometimes people expect less from you and when people expect less from you, you can, you can surprise them a little bit. And I think yeah. there's power in that. Um, but I guess so, maybe, but that's kind of just par for the course, right? I mean, people are always going to underestimate And it's you. in pockets, right? Like as a street artist, everybody was like, oh my God, you're one of the only female street artists. But right. then the thing I often answer back is like, as so there's, there's pockets where it's like quite, you know, like there's a lot of equal opportunity, but like if, say if you go like up the auction chain or into yes. like, then you're like, oh wow, like one in 10 are women, you right. know, or right now, like I'm, I'm working on directing, learning to direct a feature film. Oh, and that's like a whole other area where it's like, forget it. Like right. it's, people are really making an active effort, but there, there's so much that needs to be done. Yeah. I, I realized that the, that the art, fine art world and the Chelsea gallery scene was like a Yale club. I had no idea when I first came to New York, yeah. you were, you were in Mexico doing your project, um, uh, with the uh, bringing awareness to the murders of the mm-hmm. women down there when I was in yeah, Juarez, when I was oh, wow. first coming to the country. Uh-huh. I mean, country. <laughs> the country of New York. Yeah. The, great, <laughs> the great republic of New York City. Well, Come on, let's face it, that's that how movie. we feel. Yeah, yeah, right. civil, civil war, after, you know. Yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah. we'll see where we fall after that. <laughs> yeah, totally. Oh my God, I spaced out on what I was thinking about there. Um, you oh, were no. saying I was working in Juarez when you came to New York. That's right, when I came to New York, and I actually had no idea that it was like a Yale's club. I didn't know Yale had an art program. Yeah. And I didn't know it was the, the top art program mm-hmm. in the country. And there definitely feels like a uh, separation of like the art world and then the art scene. Yes. The art scene seems to be like a, it's very vibrant, full of stuff. And then you have very, very specific galleries and very specific uh, trends. But you seem to have kind of bridged a little bit of that, kind of got in there. I have, but you know, I think yeah. and there's there's various ways in which I feel like throughout the art world, sometimes everyone feels like an outsider, except yeah. maybe like a couple of Yaleys. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That like <clears throat> that even somebody like me who's had 
from what looks like so much success, there are tons of moments where I feel like I'm still that like kid from the end of the dirt road that nobody yeah. really understands. That's like doing all this messy, weird shit. Yeah. You know, they're like, what do we do with you? You know, I still, I still feel that way a lot of the time. Yeah. yeah. There's that's a certain cool. level of power in that though, isn't there being the kind of constant outsider, you know, like right. I think a Tanner Arendt talks about the necessity of the artist always being on the outside because they're kind of the watchers mm. and that if they're too indoctrinated into the culture that they're not going to see and they're mm. not going to speak. That's a good but point. they kind of always have to be on the outside because they're the ones who recognize, mm. you know? And yeah. so, like, maybe there's power in that. Yeah. I do definitely feel like that as I've worked, I, I tend to go back out again, go back out again, you know, making the refs, doing Sleeping. these things. It's like, yeah, you're kind of, you get towards the center and then you're like, what am I really, what do I really care about? And that always takes me back out onto mm -hmm. the, to the periphery. Yeah, and it's, it's a very lonely thing a lot of times being an artist because it's personal practice. You're in your studio a lot. Mm -hmm. And I have a weird perspective because my engagement with art in the city has always been about like community development and me getting artists together. So when I look at you two, I, I see like a, a really cool uh, example of like somebody, you know, sharing uh, ethics, uh, ethos and aesthetics and then meeting up and having like a sort of mentor e, <clears throat> mentor e kind of uh, relationship. And that's something that's pretty magical that only happens here. Right. What yeah. was the um, project that you worked on first together? Was it um, the Deitch show? Uh, I guess, yeah, it was probably Cicada, I think, which was funny. And the reason that was specifically really funny, because I remember I first found your work when I was in middle school squatting in buildings on Bogart and Varick. I used to squat next to the Boar's Head Processing Plant. <laughs> um, Amazing. Boar's Head, the Morganel, right? Yep, on yeah. Bogart and Did Varick. you get free meat? Uh, we actually did get free meat because there was a guy downstairs. Um, I was talking about him the other day. There was a, his name was Golden Joe, and Golden Joe ran Golden Stitches, which was uh, like an embroidery place. And specifically, mm. he serviced the Boar's Head Processing Plant. And he was this big Italian dude, never had a shirt on. Disgusting man. But he always gave us cold cuts. Um, Great name. Golden yeah, Joe. Golden Joe. My he, God. Gave, he gave the meats. Yeah, Golden Joe was a lech. <laughs> Uh, but it was nice to us. Legend of Golden Joe, the meat giver. I love this. You know? That's funny. And so squatting in this building, and it was very much like there was like, you know, a service elevator. We'd like pull the chains and stop it when we needed to. So I kind of oh, would wow. live in one of these big bombed out. What Had a whole apartment. Um, 2006, maybe? Mm. Let's say maybe about 2006. Yeah. And so I'd have like a whole apartment to myself, but there was just nothing in it. You know, wow. and cinder blocks. And I was going to school in the Marcy Projects. But anyway, there were these um, enclosures because there was a lot of, super, Williamsburg was industrial. It hadn't been switched over. It was still just, you know, a lot of artists. Um, but I first came across uh, your piece. I think it was Mortimer and Jenkins was the one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is mm -hmm. these two kind of, these two skeletons kind of locked in this brawl. And I remember seeing your work and being like, oh, like that's how you do it. Like my father was a sculptor and I was like, rather than live in a way that life kind of becomes a mausoleum to the art, instead... That's how you do it. You take it, you put it in the world, you let it have a life. And that inspired me so mm. deeply. Um, but so I was always aware of your work. And I remember the first show you had at Deitch. And I was always like, it was always in my mind specifically. I think you were maybe 27 when you had that. Yeah. And so I had specifically 27 in my mind. And it was part of the reason I left bartending because I was like, by the time I'm 27, I just mm. want to be like on that path. And I oh, ended man, up leaving I, bartending, and I, then that was the first show I did uh, with you. Was your return to Deitch was Cicada? That's awesome. I had I had that plan, uh, young when I was younger. I was like, I'm gonna have my first solo show by the time I'm 18. I'm gonna do all this <laughs> stuff, you know. And then I ended up like living with my parents till I was 23 and coming to New York in 2008. Uh, it is a long game, you know. And oh so yeah, it, it's such a long lots game. of twists and turns. Absolutely, I think it's just about being in the channel. I think for me, it wasn't necessarily, nor has it ever been about success. It was just being in that channel, mm, you know. When you're making that. your work and you're engaging, and the world seems to be like coalescing to get you wherever you need to go, mm -hmm. you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I always tell artists, I like give them advice that it is a long game, that it's not a bad thing to have a lot of work that hasn't sold. Yeah. I'd always be surprised when artists are like, I have six paintings and no one's buying them. I'm like, you have six paintings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Make like a 594 more, <laughs> you know, and then, and then it'll start mattering. What do, kind of advice would you have for artists who are coming up or, or worried about this kind of thing? I mean, as an artist who lives in a house full of their own artwork, um, yeah. I just, I don't know. I mean, I think in so, I go back and forth. Like, I think on the one hand, I know for myself that I need to make my work um, yeah. because it's just how I move through the world and it's how my brain works. And yep. if I'm drawing, if I'm drawing regularly and creating regularly, it just puts me in contact with kind of like a deeper level of understanding. And I'm yeah. just a more functional human being. I know, Speaking of functional, I don't know how uh, both of you turn out the cuts at the rate you do. It's, it's amazing. <laughs> 
And every time I show your work, someone comes up to me and says, where'd you get this laser cut? I know. Oh, no. <laughs> every Blasphemy. time. Did you ever get that too? <laughs> For sure. Actually, now I do use a laser cutter. <laughs> nice. But, um, I was like, like, but on the big ones, I was very purist for many years. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I just personally, I, I now my, my energy like runs differently. It's a little broader. Yeah. But back then, I, I just had this, oh, like irrepressible rage for life. And I would just fire it into the paper, into the block. Yeah. I needed something that I could like decimate Absolutely. so that I was like decimating something constructively. I, you think know? I think it's really true. Like I really believe that with that deep creative force, there's always the shadow side. And I think people who have that need to constantly generate that if you don't do it, it kind of turns in on itself, mm. kind of like an Ouroboros thing. And so we've got a bit, I won't say of a death wish, because it's not that, mm-hmm. but I think there's this kind of really kind of chaotic, destructive mm. element that comes along with the mm-hmm. ability to create, mm-hmm. and it needs to be expressed. And so you can mm. either do it through your work and make big, beautiful, crazy shit, um, or maybe there's less constructive ways. <laughs> and you both really do make big, beautiful, crazy shit. Yeah. Well, for, I, I always... That tree in the Brooklyn Museum is pretty crazy, too. Yeah. I mean, How long did that take? Um, that, I mean, at that point I had like a lot of people helping me. So, you know, we had like huge walls full of those paper cuts, you know, the hand dyeing, all that fabric. I mean, it was intense. The only thing that I weirdly commandeered and did my entire self was I hot glued every strip of fabric and people kept going, stop, what are you doing? Why don't you let somebody help you with that? And I was like, no, this is my thing. (laughs) That was the weird thing I got. But yeah, it it took a long time and a lot of of people, a a big team. I mean, I love working with a team and also I need to go retreat into my own, you mm. know, inner wilderness or studio. You know, I have a little studio in my apartment and then I have my larger studio where I have people help me. Yeah. And I do a ton of stuff in my little studio because I just need to be by myself. Like I can't, the, it's sort of like the origination thoughts have to happen privately for me most of the time. Yeah. And then the kind of second generation where you're just like, should this blue be this shade or this shade? Mm-hmm. Those kinds of thoughts I can have in like a public setting. You know what I mean? Right, right, right. I, oh, I'm sorry. Um, no, I think the way that I feel about it is like the bones aren't formed yet. Like mm-hmm. if I'm on my own and I have a conception of something, like I yeah. need to let it. I need to let it become solid because if I let too many voices in, it's like, that's like right. it's gone. That's right. Mm. And it's such kind of an intimacy that's required in order to kind of like bring that idea to fruition. And then when you bring people in, there's some ways in which you have to be able to relinquish. There's some ways in which you have to be able to defend. And like, I don't think you can do that mm. until it's gotten to mm. like its bones are like, you know, together. Right. That's Hell true. Yes. That's true. You said you were using a laser cutter now, like in kind of adopting more technology and mm-hmm. stuff. If you, mm-hmm. uh, have you made an NFT? <laughs> I did. I, well, you know, I was just saying today I did, I did this, I'm working on this film and the whole first wave of film sets was like p- made possible by having, by Cicada becoming an NFT. Oh, so wow. like, oh, that was with I, Super Chief, right? That was with Super yeah, Chief, exactly. That. It was this kind of magical moment where this thing that had already been created was able to kind of generate enough like income to actually get the next project started. So it was like quite beautiful. But like, I feel like the thing that happens that I've been working now for, I mean, I'm 46, right? So like you get really obsessed with things and then it's like at some point you, I do finally that like I want to hand it off. Like, and yeah. that for me was the moment with the laser cutter. Someone brought me this laser cut and they were like, look what this machine can do. And it was the first time I was like, wow, I actually can't do that with my hand. This right. it was cutting this hard paper and da, da, da. And I was ready. I was like, you know what? I need to be able to now focus my attention on sculptures on these more sort of community-based projects, not just in the space of the cutting where I had spent for so many years. So I was kind of ready for a tool to like let me adopt more mediums. Yeah, it's gotta be tough when you when you find success to balance the idea of, of creating new work and expanding your skill set and experimenting more yeah. when there's when you're known for something. For sure. And it's like all this pressure on you to keep doing that thing mm-hmm. forever. It's pressure both ways because it's like it's pressure to change all the time and not be boring, yeah. but it's also pressure to, to then not change, to just stamp out the same thing for the rest of your life or to not go through ugly duckling phases. Yeah. Which like if you're truly in your creative zone, you, have to. you are going to have awkward moments. <laughs> <laughs> Morgan, what was your ugly duckling phase? Um, I don't know. I <laughs> kind of like ne- really never really asked for too many opinions. I always just hold myself and, and just, it's very therapeutic and I just lose myself and time doesn't exist. And I, mm-hmm. I've had projects that have taken me over a year to make mm-hmm. yeah. and complete. And, um, it's, it's exhilarating to finish it, but also sad kind of sometimes mm-hmm. when you finish a big piece, you're totally. like, goodbye friend. And the you journey is over. To the next one. Or you you know, nuts. right. <laughs> uh, I'm very fast with my work. I, so what I do is I paint in virtual reality mm-hmm. and I mainly run my TikTok. 
where I give art history lessons while like just messing around oh, with paint mm -hmm. that is in some way related to the topic I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I've been enjoying that a lot. I have this weird relationship with the technology in the future. I have like certain things I really love like VR, but then the NFT stuff was, was tough for me because in the circles that I was in, it was just a ton of artists losing a bunch of money on mm. it and a bunch of literal scammers. Like, Maury, mm -hmm. you got scammed a little bit on yours. Guys tried to screw well, you over. Well, yeah, I had a quote-unquote manager yeah. who turned out to be a con artist. Yeah. It happens yeah. a lot. It happens a lot. It's Unfortunately, true. he was in Jersey and I'm in New York, so dealing with that legally was a little mm. bit of a pain in the ass. <laughs> Thank you, Jane Cowles. You're the best. Oh, yeah, our <laughs> art lawyer. She's she will rad. be on eventually, but she is, if you need a good art lawyer, she is the bomb. Amazing. She saved my ass. She is tough. Oh, good. Oh, she really fights. Gotta be she, tough for art sometimes, she cares right? For the, oh, oh, that's the best. Oh, she's awesome. <laughs> Do you, do you remember the pinnacle moment? Like, what was the best moment or the the thing that really solidified where you were going to go? Because for me, it was it was working at Con Artist for sure. I knew what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be in the city. I came with the like six paintings in the back, and I sold uh, collages out of a coffee shop that I worked at. And then I, I forced my way into this little artist collective mm -hmm. and became its janitor and then its manager <laughs> and then. I kind of made felt yourself useful. Yeah, yeah I, I remember, made I remember useful. the uh, the onesie, the big. The onesie. Yeah, I used to wear the zip up, uh, <laughs> the green uh, flight suit. Yeah, it was a British flight suit technically, mm. uh, but I used yeah. to do that a lot, and it did kind of like shift me from creating art, which I'm doing a lot more lately, mm. but uh, into like kind of management and that and that idea of being on the other side of the uh, of the wall. So that was kind of my pivotal moment. Do either of you, or even you, Morgan, if you have uh, um, any moments that you remember when you're I like, this I is it. I just, I don't know. I'm not sure if it's super defined for me. I've just kind of like always been an artist, you know? Yeah. Like I remember just being really little and just kind of knowing always people be like, are you going to be an artist when you grow up? And they'd be like, well, I'll probably get better at it hopefully, but I'm always going to be this. I mm. think it's kind of. When did you discover paper cutting? Um, I think probably because I, street work, I think stencil stuff. Yeah. Um, Because I think for me it was kind of like. I couldn't afford a lot of linoleum, and I wanted to kind of do linoleum. That's why I did prints. paper cutting too. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, could, I couldn't afford the linoleum, and I started doing. Um, I used to do stencils, and I used to do these really intricate, like multi-layered stencils. It was like very meticulous, and that's when I was working at the Connors Collective. So I'd be down there in the basement, cutting and cutting and spraying and fumes. Yeah. Um, and people would often, I think you were one of them, would often <laughs> see like this huge catalog of all these stencils and be like, "Oh, but those are those mm. are really interesting. The way that the light would fall through them mm -hmm. and the." the paint would kind of accumulate. Right. Yeah. Totally. And you're like, wait, this is the tool, not the art. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think I got frustrated with stencils just because I was getting so technical. Yeah. It'd be like seven layers and like it, it, it was cool, but I think I was almost getting lost in the technicality of it. Yeah. yeah. And I just liked the immediacy of just like cutting a piece of paper. Well, just the negative Orson, and positive. Of it, Orson you know? Welles said, you know, the absence of limitation is the enemy of art. Mm. It's true. Mm. I like that one. I it's think it's quote. true. I think the the limitlessness, I think especially, and I'm, you, I'm sure you have this too, is when you have a generative mind, if all is possible, it's almost like nothing is possible because it's so stifling. Like a couple parameters, I think, allow something to live, you know? Yeah. yeah. That's really neat. I like that too. Morgan, you cut a lot of paper. How do you guys not have hand cramps? <laughs> do you, get like um, a, you have to wear like a tunnel? carpal tunnel No, no, braces? hold on. I have a lecture to have? give about oh, this. Excellent. Yeah. Okay, so I thought that I had ruined my body at the age of 35. I had oh. carpal tunnel. I had sciatic. I had this, that, the other thing. I couldn't sleep on my way. My hands were falling asleep. I couldn't ride my bike. It was a whole situation. And then I went through this process where I ended up working with the uh, John Sarno was like a doctor who was the head of pain at Rusk NYU for like 40 years. And he discovered that like pretty much within reason, um, any activity that you're doing and like any injury that you've had, like if the pain is going on and on forever, including carpal tunnel and all these other things that people think are these debilitating pain conditions are actually this kind of interplay where they're essentially being um, carried on by through the nervous system by the brain and you can stop mm. it from happening. So I sheer will. You're just like, ah. It's not really sheer will. It's like a whole process that like would be its own podcast, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> but but like That's the thing that I just want to like, I'm such a proselytizer about is like we didn't destroy ourselves. We are fine. Like the body can do it. Obviously, you need rest. You need you know within reason. But like, but I used to be so much more afraid than I am of like what it what it would take to like you know work in that way. Are you a night owl or a morning person? Night owl. Yeah. No, we're <laughs> co-conspiracy. Co yeah. <laughs> it's a thing. It's a thing. It's true. Like, we really think, we, were we talking about this? Like, 
that like somebody has to stay up and watch the campfire. Like I used to be such a night owl yeah. that like when dawn would crack, I would like relax in this way where I felt like I had been holding vigil over the night. Well, mm. I think there's something kind of magical about that. I partially had it because I always kind of bartended and I always knew that if I attended bar, I'd have more days to be in my studio so that I always worked. And so mm. I had this weird crazy night schedule and I'd get home at maybe three in the morning and then I'd be in my studio and I'd work till seven and then I'd go to bed. But there's something about like those less populated hours where you can almost feel that there's less people awake. There's yeah. less energy yes. in the air. And 3 a.m. Totally. It's like, always 3 a.m. for 3 me. 3 a.m. to like 6. And I think maybe maybe it's the ADHD, but also maybe it's the energy. <laughs> when Are you also ADHD <laughs> diagnosed? Oh, definitely have this. Oh, 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 you're you're right. Right. I didn't oh, get a diagnosis, but Gabor Mate did interview yeah. me. And then at the end of the interview, he, he's like one of my heroes. Oh, yeah. He was like, uh, I think you have ADHD. Oh, wow. That was the first thing <laughs> right after the never interview. Never meet your right heroes. <laughs> right. accidentally get diagnosed with ADHD. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but actually learning about it has helped me a lot. And yeah, we've totally talked about oh, this Oh, totally. Too. Um, yeah. And I think it's maybe the ADHD, but I also think like the, because once I get up and there's all these things to do and then there's this sense of pressure, but somehow being awake when like nobody else is awake, it's like my time. Mm -hmm. I, I have the worst you know? of both worlds. Morgan has been kicking, dragging me, kicking and screaming into like the adult world of nine to five. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I can't sleep often and I like to stay up to like three, but I also do like the morning. So I'm just going to try not to sleep ever surfing again and see how that goes. Surfing has gotten me acquainted with mornings in a way I thought I would never surfing. do. Surfing, mm -hmm. nice. Because a, a nice, nothing like a dawn surf. What's your favorite surf movie? <laughs> you know, you think I'd have a North Shore. No, I don't have a. <laughs> Mine's Gidget's Beach Party. Oh, I haven't seen yeah. that one. Gidget's Beach Party. Yeah. It's got <laughs> the first, um, the first performance of Stevie Wonder what? on on film. Cool. Yeah, and he's like thirteen at the time. No I think. way. Yeah, oh yeah, my god, like that's so young. cool. It's a really funny, cheesy like little Stevie fun. at the beach. Little Stevie I think at the that's beach. His adorable. first album. Do you ever see him play drums? No. No, I, didn't know Stevie no, I swear drums. to God, look up Stevie Wonder playing drums. He is a phenomenal drum. Yeah, mm. absolutely the, phenomenal drum. Yeah. I love the conspiracy that he can actually see. <laughs> well, if you watch him play, there's a lot the drums, of evidence out there. It's wild because you know he needed someone to assist him to go around from where he was in front of the stage and bring him to the drum set. But as soon as he sat down, you know, it was like spatially, he, he just knew knows. Yeah. I think we yeah. yeah. really like. I think we really diminish what the body is capable of, just as you were totally. saying before. And I also think with with blindness or any things that we see about these disabilities, is people get kind of hemmed and caged into these little places where they're like, oh, you can't do this, you can't do that, and then right. therefore they don't try. But there are people who just like click. Yes. There's people who do sonar. There's, he's, he's called like Batman or whatever. And he like skateboards. He skateboards. Yeah. Why? Wow. Um, Real life Batman? Trees. Absolutely. Yes. Like I think we're so much. Incredible. Um, It's like we're not, uh, we're not afraid of our limitations but it's that we're limitless it's, who's, uh, is it yeah what's your yeah. name no it's um, the um, yoga bathroom quote no no, no uh, Nelson. <laughs> that one's nelson <laughs> okay sorry but I'm, i was taking it to the yoga i'm bathroom sure quote. it's ended up on a, on a, on a yoga mat somewhere <laughs> and you know um, nelson mandela died in prison and we only think he didn't because of a squirrel getting into the cern uh, collider <laughs> and changing the timeline yeah of that's course, why they absolutely. called the mandela effect yeah yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely totally. Um, but yeah, story. I think we're we're so much more limitless than we think. You know? Yeah. Well, I, me, me and wifey are not, we're like working out more and like trying to lose a little weight and I've been watching a ton of like my 600 pound life reruns. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I am amazed the human body can do that. Yeah. It's absolutely crazy. Yeah. You know, it's like, wow, we, we really are kind of we're both durable and fragile. We it's weird. can both withstand we can both. or mm -hmm. we can also kind of create. We can do both. We yeah. can we can bear a lot. Do you ever yeah, see that artist? Create a lot. Uh, I think that. I can't remember what country you're in, but they made a person that was meant to withstand auto accidents. Huh? And it's like terrifying looking. It's, it's like, like a dummy? It's like a no, it's like an artist rendering of what the human body would look like if we were built to withstand oh. a, a auto oh, wow. accidents. It's got like this huge neck, his face is all mm -hmm. smushed in. It's very disturbing, but a pretty cool Jeez. piece of art. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean you gotta envision possibilities, right? Yeah, I'd exactly. buy that for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. How would you describe your work? Uh, you were so multi multidisciplinary. Like, how how do you sum it up in one word, you? Yeah. I don't. I hate that question. I'm yeah. always like, ah, and then I do this, and then I do this. It's like a terrible conversation. We're like, what are you talking about? Right, right, right. But I I mean, I just say, what do I say? You're an you're artist. Right? I make stuff. <laughs> you're basically That's what I say. I yeah, make stuff. I make stuff. You, yeah, you're, you're proof that you don't need to do that, right? Yeah. yeah, which is good. Because I feel I feel that pressure to do that, too. But so. that goes along with being ADHD. <laughs> like because yes. you well, get have bored and when you see so at, for me a lot of times as I'm making a piece and going through material 
I'll see something else that will just lead to a completely totally. different idea. Because they have a, yeah, you have the multi-channel mind no, the project's oh, going. But I got to finish this first, mm. you it's know, true. but. For yeah. me, it's like having multiple, like, I feel like it's like multiple wheels. Yeah. And it took a time to, a while to get them running, but I'll go and I'll spin this one and that one's spinning yes. and then I go and spin the next yes. one and then I go and spin the next and one. And it lets your mind think. Oh, I have to like. Back and forth. Yeah, you need to pause on that oh, problem. Oh, I'm a Peter. I got to like, yeah. I got to, I have to move. It's like movement is how I There's think, no boring you know? moments. Yeah. yeah. I always have like seven projects going and I'm trying to stick really hard mm -hmm. to it. I it, It's very much a challenge for me to be like, okay, just keep doing it. I know you don't want to do it anymore, but yeah. like keep doing it. And then there's a breakthrough moment where you're like, wow. Okay, this was worth it. I'm glad I forced myself to continue exploring this idea. So you guys are each other's doppelgangers, right? <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, yeah, there was, um, I think I worked on, um, what was it, the house our family is built? Mm -hmm. Was that the one? I was working on a, a truck project. Uh -huh. Someone built this beautiful truck. Um, and I was like wallpapering every inch of it. And I think when you sent out the press release for like PBS, it was yes. me. Yes. And I didn't even like mention you. it. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> I was like, you're doing this. <laughs> well, people would often awesome. think like, people would often think I'm you because like we've got like similar style, we've got the hair, you know. I've we got, really like, do. We feel way. similar. And we even feel similar to each other. Like I think when you, when you, yeah. Way, yeah. I feel and I like, remember us like staying up all night at Deitch. Just talking about the oh, weirdest, most mystical cicada. shit. And I was like, oh, this is my sister. <laughs> and the, um, <laughs> the radio transmitter theory, you yes. know, about how we come from these families that are like a lot of mental illness, but also like a lot of mystic mm. mysticism, you know, like mm -hmm. so much charisma, so much power, so much magic, but also like so much kind of deep mental illness. Yeah. They go and hand in hand, don't oh, they? To a, a frightening degree. Um, but I've always felt like I'm kind of like that one who's kind of standing on the precipice of yeah. my family. And I feel mm. like to a certain extent, perhaps you're that also, as well. Also, and growing up and sort of feeling that path through your creativity and totally. like as your creativity blossoms and like the, the sort of fear slash like curiosity and the mm -hmm. whole thing. And yeah. And you got me to, um, to, to start back on my morning pages again. Oh, well, I, that's good. Cause I have to get back on my I had forgotten for like four years. Journaling? Yeah, this mm -hmm. process from like it's it's the specific process where you wake up and the second you open your eyes you just, just start do your three pages. you just write oh, three pages uh, totally uncensored mm -hmm. and um I had been doing it for so many mm -hmm. years and then I forgot and you you mentioned it again and it was like I just felt like it was part of those late night conversations they were mm -hmm. so kind of fruitful and that was one of the outcomes for me was that I got back into this practice that's so important that I felt think like my, such a potent my page would just be coffee 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 yeah, yeah. coffee <laughs> where's I need my coffee, coffee? where's my coffee in the morning <laughs> and like every like. Just the most, it's your worst self mm -hmm. just getting, or I don't know, me, for me, it's, it it's often very like petty and oh, totally. bitchy and all the, and it's just like draining out your worst self to get it totally. out of the way in the morning. <laughs> you, you need to, I think like, like okay, have your, have your peace, go ahead. Okay. Now get on with it. You have to. I think it's like exfoliating kind of like a layer of shit, essentially. Yeah. It's like, I think yeah. that we and walk And brilliant around. ideas too. And brilliant <laughs> ideas too. And then you can get these kind of little glimmers and pieces, but I think that process of like getting up and like writing is so essential because- you guys are me, convincing me. I might have to start doing it. Too. You should you honestly. I think I think anybody would would benefit it. And I like proselytize to tell everybody mm -hmm. about it. It's good. And I look through my notebooks, and I think as we were saying about coming from these kind of wild families, I don't know if you feel like this, but I definitely feel like I mean, art saved my life. Yeah. Art saved my life. Art taught me how to be a person. Art mm -hmm. taught me organization. It taught me discipline. Mm -hmm. And it was always and the symbolism and the dreams. Like it was always this safe place I had inside of me that if I kept engaging with it, it would. Find a way to connect me with the It's an amazing thing yes. to know why you're here. Mm, yeah. You know, you I feel like, you know, some people have been, you know, they search for the answer or whatever. I'm like, I'm yeah. here to make art and to inspire mm -hmm. and to do big things, to inspire other people to do bigger and better things, mm -hmm. uh, to make people laugh along the way, mm -hmm. which is very important as well. <laughs> Absolutely. So I'm like, I know why I'm here. I have a purpose, damn it. <laughs> I have something to say. It's true. <laughs> And it's experiential and it's rooted. I think that like, you know, I think art is awesome, but I think art at its best is a means of engagement. It's the way that we exist with each other. And I was thinking about this recently that like the jobs you do and like whatever happens in your life, like it's important, but it's all a stage. What really matters is. Did you, did you either of you have uh, any job like day jobs, like funny day jobs or weird things you did before you really focused and doubled down on your work? Uh, I was always kind of. Um, not, nothing too weird. No, I kind of just knew since I was a little kid that I'd probably be like a bartender so I could make art. Yeah. I once did secret nude modeling at a Catholic school. That's <laughs> secret <laughs> nude modeling at a Catholic school. It was school. a figurative mo uh, art class, but yeah. it was had to be secret. Why? Because of the nuns? Because of the nudity. Oh, yeah. Ooh. The nuns are just like in the <laughs> back there with their rulers <laughs> just waiting for you. Uh, I certainly I think, don't tell them. I think 
my uh, my weirdest was working at a 24-hour cafe on St. Mark's, and I'd work the night Ooh, shift. You must have seen it all. Wow. That mine. place was, and it was called Bad Burger. And I, Bad Burger. Bad what was your Burger. Burger. We talked about mine. I worked at a few weird places. I oh, worked at Blockbuster, which I like the Wait, best what? job. Blockbuster? Oh, Blockbuster <laughs> Video. Oh, my yeah. God. The vacuuming. Yeah. I love the vacuuming. Up. And Oh, I did get in trouble. <laughs> Several because times. I made a, a false account of the, the na- under the name Mike Hunt. Yes, of course. Uh, Classic. And I, I, I didn't realize that would be a big problem, but I got written up for that. Yeah, right up. Mine was uh, really weird. I worked at the um, Webster Hall music venue, mm-hmm. and they put me in a like cigarette girl tray with five dollar beer and water, and I had to walk through the floor during like a crowded mm-hmm. concert mm-hmm. and like bang around with a mag light, like get out of the way, get out of the way. That was rough. Yeah. <laughs> I think the weirdest thing I ever got paid to do was give the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia a graffiti lesson in Murray Hernandez Park. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Get it. Wow. Yeah, that was the weirdest. And it was funny, too, because it was very much like a manifesty kind of thing. Like, I had had a show actually with you. That was Banshee, remember? We oh, did that yeah. show together. Yeah. I had had a show in the wintertime, and I put it up, and I took it down to the same day, which I don't do anymore. But I did that, and I just broke even. And I had a feeling I had to go to New Orleans, and I was like, man, I need $1,000 just need a thousand dollars so I could do this. And the next day I got a text from somebody who's like, Hey, I have a VIP client who wants to go do graffiti. And it was like <laughs> 3 PM on like, it's a, like a Saudi prince. A <laughs> that's a weird, that's he a didn't weird tell one. me that. And I was like, I was like, what the fuck? I was like, no, dude, who the fuck is this? And it turns out I knew his brother and he ran like a tour company of New York or something. Oh, and wow. so we went back and forth and I was like, all right, dude, if you give me like, Five, and he was like, it was going to be 500 bucks. And I was like, no. And then he was like, what if I give you $1,000? I was like, all right, if you give me $1,000, yeah. I will bring a stencil and I will bring a canvas and I will hang out with you for half an hour. But you have to send me 500 bucks right now. Oh, wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> get that deposit. You get that yeah, deposit. Yeah, there you go. And I like, I like go to Patanga in Bushwick and he comes in and he's like, okay, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. So the client, and I'm like, who is this going to be? He's like, it's the crown prince of Saudi Arabia. It's Which his cousins. One? Um, I don't know. It was his like cousin's it's like so 20, 21st end, birthday like, or something. You're like, let's keep in touch and meet up next year? <laughs> yeah. I can keep on giving you these lessons, by the way. Well, you I think he's happy. like part of the Bushwick culture, because I've heard from a lot of people who have had like weird similar experiences. But like, yeah, I like go out and there's like an entourage of like Saudis in like white outfits, like oh, yeah. eating like artichoke pizza. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. okay, like whatever, I'm going to do this, man. And I like lead them to Maria Hernandez Park. And yeah, I like gave them like a, a graffiti lesson. He was like, no, that's like, pretty we, trippy. We want to go tagging. And I was like, look, dude, I'm not going to go yeah. tagging. The Saudi prince wants to go tagging now. I'm like, I'm not going to go tagging with you at 3 p.m. on a Monday because I'm going to get arrested. So the answer is no, dude. And so they ended up reading like writing like happy birthday, bro. On oh this, my like, God. Canvas. Happy birthday, bro. You know? Nice. Happy birthday. Bro. That's yeah. sweet. Good and then they, they get back and he's like, oh, thank you so much. You like managed their expectations. And I was like, yeah, sure, dude. And, like whatever. And he sends me, he sends me another 500 bucks. And I make it to New Orleans, and I learned how to Do say no. Show. Amazing. Because sometimes you got to tell the crown prince of Saudi Arabia no. <laughs> the power of saying no. Such a nice dom vibe you have with that. <laughs> I know. No, sir. <laughs> but yeah, that was definitely the weirdest. That was the weirdest. That is, that's pretty weird. Thank you. That's amazing. <laughs> that's so I think funny. about that sometimes when I, when I feel in lack, because I'm like, you know what? If you need things, the universe will provide. It, it some does seem to work out that way. I, and it's funny because I'm not one to typically feel that way like oh fade and all that stuff but it does happen to me all the you time you don't you don't believe in a secret no <laughs> so i do feel i do I feel do. that like projects they seem to get some kind of an indwelling spirit mm-hmm. that tends mm-hmm. to draw things toward it you know there's like a stickiness in a yeah. it forms i think it's true i think that like wherever you wherever attention is focused like things tend to pool mm-hmm. it's just the way it is i really yeah. think that's true i think it's a difference between mm-hmm. like manifestation and attraction right like the law of attraction is obviously like the more mm-hmm. you look for something the more you find it if you become obsessed with a number you see it everywhere if you're you know obsessed with the color you see it everywhere and you, be, you i think you open yourself up more to just noticing the things that are on that path mm-hmm. as opposed to like, I love that guy who goes, uh, you know, I owe the banks a lot of money. 
little do they know I've discovered the power of manifestation. <laughs> 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 oh, I'm manifesting it, you know. There seems to be something. There's so much that we don't know about the way the world works. If you That's think true. about like the way gravity acts on space time and the, the the gesture you were just making about attention, I was like, Yeah, we don't fucking know how consciousness acts on oh, absolutely. You know, like we don't. There's, yeah. We don't know we don't know if the consciousness is materially generated by the brain. There's or if so it's outside the body, or all, if the, it's like, all a hologram, which I think it might <laughs> like, be. I have a theory. Really down to to some basic stuff we don't know. Yeah, it's true. I have a theory. I love this picture that shows the known universe mm-hmm. and the map of the human brain, like the neurons mm. of the human brains, and yeah. they look identical. Lovely. They look exactly the same. Oh my God. And, <laughs> it blew my mind. No, I, and I really thought, like, is this mean that, like, the thing we think of as God is, like, are we actually literally in a creature's mm. brain right now? Like, are we a tiny Damn. microscopic piece <laughs> of a brain? I think it's so, possible. Like, <laughs> it is possible. I think we definitely are all connected in a, in a very serious way. There's a lot of evidence of that, of like people inventing the same things and kind of like, oh, totally. like you know, having a bad dream about somebody and then you find out they died. It's like, oh, yes. that stuff happens a lot, too much to, to be ignored. nothing. That's the thing. Yeah, we, I think that's where the art dwells too. Mm-hmm. Like I like, um, I read it so long ago, but I recently picked it up again, like the holographic, it's like the holographic theory of the universe. And one of the things that it talks about is below the subatomic level, there is a level where everything is non-localized. So everything is everywhere at the exact same time. Mm-hmm. And so we have this feeling that things are separate when truthfully they all occupy the same space. Welcome and to so, the quantum mechanics podcast. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's kind of true. I mean, I think the, the idea that we're, we're separate is actually the great farce and we live in a culture mm-hmm. that lives off of that, but it's really not true, yeah. you know? And I think like the collective unconscious and like art and all these things that we draw from are come from that place where everything is actually like yeah like connected. when you talk about time time going away or something it sort of feels to me like it's it's that's that's the moment when you sort of rejoin something a little bit bigger than yourself and you mm-hmm. you gain access to sort of mm-hmm. energies and forces and information that just don't feel like they only came from you and there's totally. sort of something about like flow state and inspiration mm-hmm. And the and the creative process that I feel like tends to just like dust you with a little bit of that dusting. <laughs> We've been dusted. I feel like it, it's. I think that's so true. I think it really opens you. Like I feel that way about. Like I feel that way really about drawing. And I think it's one of the ways that I like kind of learned how to be a person despite being kind of raised by wolves. <laughs> um, Were you raised by literal badgers. wolves? I was raised by badgers. Oh, I think that's similar. I think that's similar thing Not going as on. Not glamorous as wolves, but same idea. You might and just be furries. <laughs> Uh oh! Don't supplant that in my mind. <laughs> um, but I think it also has to do with attention too. And I think that like when you're deeply attentive, it's like when the maybe it's Mary Howe who said it, but when the when their hands are busy, the mind falls open. Mm-hmm. And when we're in some kind of process where we're our body is being engaged, mm-hmm. it kind of like because it's being engaged, mm-hmm. it kind of opens us up to what else is yes. there. And when I'm drawing, I'll be kind of, and I feel this way about my drawings too, because it's like very much like negative and positive space. It's like, I feel like I'm both creating and discovering something at the same time. Mm. And I'll kind of like, while I'm drawing, I'll be like, oh, that makes sense. Or like, I'll, I'll just figure out like my life will make sense to me while I'm kind yeah. of drawing. You also, know? you said something about self-regulation. And mm-hmm. I just this week, I just had to like do some drawings that I like had to do on a deadline. But I was also like having a really emotionally like, whoa, like messy it's blah, 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 mm-hmm. week. And I, it was crazy that I was like, but well, after all these years, I, I, I have to be reminded that nothing in the world calms me down and focuses me like drawing. It's yeah. just like, whoop, and then you're here, and ev- and you can you can get through the day in a way that like maybe that day like wasn't gonna be gotten through. You know? oh, <laughs> Isn't it crazy how you can forget though? I have mm-hmm. the same thing. The only thing I've ever wanted to get better at is drawing. Yeah. And it's somehow I feel like if I don't do it, I build up this resistance to it. Maybe you both as creatives have this too. But like, yeah, like drawing is just doing it just makes everything else like make literal. And I do, I do think that it was like a childhood thing for us, probably like we both Mm. grew up in super chaotic environments. Right. And so like coloring, I just think it was, it was the thing that we learned and it truly regulated us, Mm -hmm. focused us. And in it to this day, it's like nothing else acts in that way. Yeah. A lot of beautiful art and, and artists come from that kind trauma and that kind of need for regularity and, and relaxation. Does it relax you when you, you do your cuts, Morgan? Um, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's huge, uh, therapeutic factor for me. Yeah. For uh, me too with painting, but, um, strangely VR has really unlocked that for me hmm. a lot more because I was, I enjoy making art a lot, but I'm very much like a concept person. So I start with a concept and I try to do it. 
uh, and then I like the result and I get better, but I really wanted to be an abstract painter. I just wanted to have fun and just mm -hmm. like splatter paint around and like make colors and shapes that I think are calming or nice or, you know, feel something. Uh, and I could never do it physically. Like every time I would get the physical pain and start doing it, I'd have the same process where I would like get about halfway through. I would like it. It would look weird in like an 80s, you know, those like patterns in 80s mm -hmm. diners with those little mm -hmm. wiggles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All, like, yeah, yeah. It just turned into that, which is cool, I guess. <laughs> but then I would get frustrated and just go completely um, like black. The end of it, it would be four hours long and it would end up with a pure black canvas every More time. More of a performance. Yeah, but it was a performance for nobody. Yeah. <laughs> it was a performance for me and it would just make me frustrated. Uh -huh. And now I can go into VR and just like turn it on and just like play all day and there's like no... Um, there's no risk. There's no, I'm not losing money on paint. How I, interesting. Don't I don't feel held back that by you it. Found your, that yeah. you sort of needed the technology to evolve I to did. meet you. I think I did. Yeah, I think I did. I've always had a thing with tech. I really do love it, uh, which is why it surprises people when I'm not super gung-ho on NFTs. And that's just the market. That's not the mm -hmm. nature of mm -hmm. them. The technology itself is not wrong. It's just the way we use it, you know. Agreed. Like, you know, exacto knives. They're not evil. <laughs> <laughs> Just because I could stab you with it. Yeah. 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 Sharp as if a razor. You make me. Yeah, it, took me a, it took me a long time to actually start putting them like in a jar somewhere. Like, oh, rather than just mm. throwing them on the floor? Because literally, once I realized that you can just throw them on the floor and walk on them, I was like kind of. Well, I had one of those experiences. <laughs> wait, I was, wait, what? Like the, my, the little ulfas, you can snap them and just walk on them with bare oh, feet. Like, oh, hand to God, I've never gotten cut from that. No, like, exactly. Oh I wouldn't do. I wouldn't do You can't do, do that because I've had it go the wrong way before. Oh, oh yeah. Those right. are a lot more. That's well, more real estate. Well, I got one that was standing straight up. I don't know. And oh, these nice. guys got bit. No. Yeah, yeah. And I like was like, oh, shit. And my studio mate, who Ian Bertram, who you know. Um, I'm like, oh man, I'm about to pull it out. He's like, don't do it, don't, don't do it. it. Yeah. I pull it out and he's like, oh, he like pulls out his phone. I to turn it. It took me, it took me a long time. Well, order is something that took me a really long time yeah. to learn. As oh an my artist. god. And maybe well, we're similar because I feel like we have ADHD a similar. Also, it's ADHD and it's the CPTSD. Honestly. Oh, absolutely. Like it's oh, just, it's 100 yeah. the complex yeah. PTSD. I need order. I crave it. It makes me feel safe. I yeah, didn't even know opposite. I liked it. I was like lived in complete chaos. And oh, I thought I that that was like my generative space. And then I started to find little spaces. of, And I was like, wait a minute. Like I'm so much calmer. And now I've like, I'm learning to clean my house. But also it was like emotional hoarding and not mm -hmm. processing. You know, the mess, the mess was truly was chaotic. It truly oh, was me like hiding the chaos of my life in my physical world. Mm. I, I kind I feel like that. I had a dream recently. And I know we're both like people totally but i had a, a dream like maybe like a year ago and it was there was like a little old lady like riding around on a bicycle and like i'm a big like cyclist that's my thing and she was so old and so gnarled that if she got off the bike she would just fall apart and she's riding riding and then there was i came across this woman who had this like wolf in her chest and it was like oh like crazy and ravenous wow. and she was like we pretend to drown so people think that we're separate me and the wolf but we're actually the same and i think there's something about living in chaos that you can kind of obscure you can say oh it's just the mess but really it's kind of a part mm. of yourself that's not mm. fed and i think for me that idea of like that internal kind of self which is kind of like a wolf is maybe the art like we become very infused with the things that we do artistically like i know yeah. i am because it kind of taught me how to be a person but for me i realized that if i'm living in chaos and i'm not taking care of myself and i'm not taking care of that wolf it goes rabbit it's fucking mm. crazy mm. you know yeah. um but only to say that we like, you know, we try to, we can obscure our shadow with a mess. But truthfully, there's always something we're kind of hiding. You know, a little hiding bit. It. Yeah. <laughs> I had like a very nice childhood, actually. And uh, I know I'm not bragging here. I'm just saying that, like, in my opinion, uh, it caused like the opposite reaction in me, which was like I had a lot of stability. So I crave chaos mm -hmm. and I, I seek it out and things that are like, you know, vulgar and obs obscene and crazy. Like they, they, I really am attracted to them because I'm like, I, I, I need it. I didn't get enough of it. So it's like a weird balance thing, right? Like we need one of anything. And I feel bad when my, I, my friend used to say, it takes bad parents to make good kids. Yeah. <laughs> it takes good parents to make me. <laughs> <laughs> to make bad kids. Well, it's one of those things, right? There can be so many things that you can say like, oh, this was great or this was horrible. And like, there's, mm -hmm. you know, there's trauma everywhere. Everybody's got trauma. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, I feel like I always kind of needed something to push against. And I think that like, because there were things kind of missing for me, it's why I found art, you know, right. it's because I found some system that made sense to me. 
and it was drawn. Yeah, and you can make sense. Like, when you don't have power, you're like, oh, but I can make but this. This makes I, sense. This square sheet totally. can make I can, my, my, the world can make sense within this parameter. Totally. And I think what you I do. I can affect it. I can change absolutely. it. I matter here. And it teaches you that you can actually have an effect on the world. Yes. And I think when you're raised in chaos, you have yeah. this idea that because the internal is chaos and the external is chaos, you have a feeling that you can actually affect change upon the world. Mm -hmm. But when you find whatever that system is, whether it's like music or art making, like you find that, you attach to it, you close the door, you spin a world from it, yeah. and then you kind of use it to like patch what's missing in your own system. Music. And it almost becomes like a cyborg kind of synthesis, you know? Mm, totally. Yeah. Music was my first love and my first uh, field of study mm -hmm. when I went, I was homeschooled uh, from the fifth grade. Wow. Uh, and then I decided to go back to school, junior college, and I had an amazing music teacher. Uh, and he and I really loved music and I that was all I was doing in my room by mm -hmm. myself I was practicing music the way I practice art now uh, and then I guess also kind of born out of trauma in a weird way because my mm -hmm. great music teacher uh, had an aneurysm in class oh. Oh, and no. just fell over and died in front of everybody oh. oh my god yeah it was very traumatic and the worst thing about it was a week before I leaned to my friend and I said this guy's gonna have an aneurysm because <gasps> he was so energetic and wow. crazy and like bang his head about, on the you got a little bit of the mystical oh, thing there too Brandon. Like, there you go no, that's this. the shining but don't blame yourself you I did I yeah. totally did you did you did you did that's normal no, yeah. for, for like a month afterwards oh, did like, you tell anybody in the class that I murdered no I, I thought it was a murderer no I'm not yeah run no kids that. yeah well yeah oh. that's what I'm saying because someone could have turned you in I know I probably could have gotten prosecuted I don't know been rough but then I discovered art, and it was weird because I've always drawn, and I've mm -hmm. always kind of doodled and made art and stuff, but I was not good, or and I didn't actually have a, a confidence in it, or it didn't do for me what you guys, how you describe it, until I took a life That's class. the moment that you shifted from music to art? Was that is that the music, moment? yeah. Whoa. I shifted from music to art because they replaced him with a very classical, you know, uh -huh. her idea was that right. your ultimate life goal would be to first chair violin in an orchestra. And I wanted to make like weird, you know, like like for curiosity, metal and shit and like <laughs> strange things. Um, because uh, like I was saying before, and yeah, I shifted over because I loved the study of art. I actually thought it was my, it was the best subject in school that fascinated me the most. So I studied art history and art practice mm -hmm. and I was lucky enough to be able to like do bronze foundry and stuff. It was a really oh, good school, oh. but it was a, it was a little junior college and that, that's when that shifted for me. Uh, and it's now I'm here, you know, I came to New York in 2008 with six paintings in the back and I've raised a little, a little career out of it. And so it's, it is a really great space to be in. I love art. And uh, I can't really? stop making it either now. <laughs> I can't Obsession. help it. Yeah. Obsession can't fueled. Help it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is just like a lifestyle, right? <laughs> it's like a way, it's like something you just have to do, no matter what's happening, you know? It, yeah. It, it, I feel like it's a way, it's a way to, like everything I address, everything that happens to me at some point or another, again, it's getting kneaded in to the art process that like, that some that there's always like like that I feels like that's my activating principle and I'm everything that I do it's it's gonna become a part of it. Mm, yep, definitely. Yeah, I feel like <clears throat> I I make and write music and record all the time and I feel like my art intertwines with my music and what I do and the little sketches that I make it mm -hmm. all kind of you know works hand in hand. Yeah, I feel like we like, kind of have a wheelhouse. Like I'm very unmusical, but I'm a writer mm -hmm. and I'm like working on film and I'm working on these things where I'm like I'm noticing that where like you have you have like a you know there's like a zone. It's mm -hmm. never just one zone. But but it's not instant crossover. It's not like oh because I'm an artist I'm going to be able to make music. Right. Or, they just came mm -hmm. naturally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think they kind of like there's things that kind of dovetail for me and like I think my my writing has always kind of come alongside my work and then like if I'm writing about it I can kind of oh figure out what the work is saying and like I don't know that there's two there always seems to be some other element that's entwined you know yeah and like you were saying earlier like you, know, you hate the question of like how do you describe yourself how do you put yourself in context uh for art with those materials or the kind of work mm -hmm. you do uh, I I think that like art is anything that is creative it could be writing or photography or drawing or music You're sandwich making yeah i get in trouble sometimes my colleagues don't like it when i say i think the most sophisticated and highest form of art right now is video games yeah because they sure. contain it's, everything for sure absolutely. do you have do you play any i actually don't but i'm really fascinated by them for that reason mm -hmm. like i'm really fascinated just in general with like world building and these yeah. sort of new ways that people are interacting with like creativity and all these and yeah so i never i wasn't like a game kid but i would always like every time i would like come home from college i would like make i would just be like to my brother, like, play your games, I'll watch. And they were like, this is weird. Yes. I, was <laughs> yeah, no, I just wanted to know what it was, you know? Yeah. No, growing up, I mean, playing uh, Civilization 2 was blast. Yeah. Civilization 2, Sid Meier's. And They're then we had, uh, I actually played, um, yeah, no, all Sid Meier's games are amazing. In SimCity, 
Mm, yes. Spent a lot of time on SimCity creating cities. That yeah. was always a blast. Yeah, Have exactly. you guys played SimCity? Um, no, I mean, I remember playing The Sims as, like, a, I guess when I was in middle school. Um, but you know how kids are in middle school and they're playing The Sims. It's all, they're all just killing them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think the evidence that it's art is the fact that, like, Twitch, right? You know, Twitch is huge. And you log in there and you see, like, millions of people watching other people play video games. Wow. No, you know, they're not actually doing it. It's like the, <laughs> they're watching somebody play a video my, game. My just nephew as engaging. was playing a video game and watching someone else play a different video game <laughs> on Twitch. Yikes. I'm like, how are you even able to do that? That's weird. How well, is it even possible? I think that's part, like, the that attention-wise, I think that is, like, a bad thing. I think the way yeah. that, like, attention is getting, like, like so split off is, like... I think it's done. It's not happening. I mean, it's already it's happened. And I, I mean, I kind of, like, you know, not to be, like, you know, but, like, I worry about the youth, you know? Like, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I really think that, like, attention is something that is innately whole and is not really supposed to be fractured, you know, almost scattered, like like buckshot almost, mm. you know? And I think that like, especially with like the phone, and I can do it too, I can get so lost in there. But isn't that focusing? That is your whole attention is then focused on that. Focused, but not in like a generative way. It's kind of just like like entertaining. I'm just watching and watching, watching. Right. I think it's different from like, um, there's a website I love called The Marginalian, um, and she's a writer and she does these little hyperlink things. So she'll be like loneliness and like, uh, loneliness and the blues, and she'll hyperlink all these things. And I'll read that little blurb, I'll put it down and then I'll think about it for a day. It's like generative, but I feel like the way that attention is now, we're just kind of splitting it off and like, I don't know, we're just like constantly like entertained rather than like activated in some way, you know? What do y'all think about AI art? Oh. <laughs> you know what? Okay, so I was both like, holy fucking shit, when I like saw that I was on the list that got scraped to make oh, Mid Journey. Yeah. And I was I like, oh, okay, didn't like bother to call me. Yeah, um, right. But I also have to admit that like I totally have Mid Journey and I totally, I want to know what the hell's going on in there. I want to like play with it. I want to be like, oh, how can I use this? Yeah. What can I, you know, because sometimes it even just as a tool, I'm just like, anytime a tool gets invented, I want to know what that tool's going to do. Yeah. It is pretty amazing. Yeah. It's weird mm -hmm. what it's doing. It's very strange. It's yeah. scary, but but exciting at the same time. Yeah. You know, and there's something that's still very soulless about it, and I don't know that it will always be that way, but... Yeah, well, that's the funny thing, too, right, is that there's some essential quality does seem to be missing, yeah. and maybe it's a quality that simply cannot be regulated. Like, you can't make it out of AI. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, I'm trying to think what it's who is it talks Sting about. Sting said that. Sting is it mentioned Sting? that there was no soul. Like you can recreate music, but not the soul of the song. Right. Uh -huh. I think Nick Cave talks and about that too. Probably yeah. also, and I mean, now we're going to get all philosophical, but I, but that thing that we that I was saying before about sort of the indwelling spirit that seems to be kind of lightning rotted into the work. Mm -hmm. That like it, 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 how is that happening? If in is that like a, a factor of consciousness of of, hum, of humanity, or does there become a point at which like the AI can actually generate something akin to that? I saw something terrifying the other day. It's a mm -hmm. YouTube video. It's pretty cool. It's weird. It was um, the reverse Turing test. So it is a man sitting in a train compartment. Mm -hmm. It's in virtual reality. So there's a four or so different NPCs that are all supposed to be different people in history. You got. Um, Cleopatra over there, you got Mozart, uh, and basically they are all different AI systems. And the first part of the video is scripted. Then it says here after, from here on out, this is not scripted. And what it was, was these different AI systems trying to figure out which one among them was the human. Whoa. And they're talking to each other and giving their assumptions mm -hmm. on it. And oh. it was super <laughs> creepy because like all the comments were like, I thought once they discovered you, they're going to like leap up and attack you. <laughs> like, they're so scared of it. But it is getting very close. And there, it does like raise some interesting questions. I, I'm not afraid of AI art because I think that the thing that people value most about art is right. the individual expression of the human who made it. Yeah. So it's like it's kind of safeguarded in a way. And, the, and just the sense still that they're not inventing yet, that it's still yeah. just a synthesis robot. And that like ac that actual moment of invention is still the thing that we don't really even understand how it happens. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you've been a great interview. I could just like sit here all day and we could talk <laughs> about this stuff. Unfortunately, we are about out of time, about two yeah. minutes left. So if you've got anything coming up, like what's what's next for all of you? Uh, I'm going to do a show in Paris called In the Land of the Sibilants. Ooh. And it's the Ooh. first time that I'm presenting the world of this fairy tale that I've written that I'm sort of hoping to publish as a novella and make as a film. And so it's kind of it's one of its first real public outings. It's going to be in Paris this September. Oh, September in Paris. Ooh. Look out. I think. Awesome. You got anything on the docket? Uh, this weekend, I'm finally um, working on my 10 foot 5 piece. 
Oh yeah, finally. That thing is awesome. Yeah, you, I can't wait. It's gonna change it. my life. Yes. It will change your life. Oh, if you say it enough, it will happen. <laughs> as we as we <laughs> discover that through that this conversation. Awesome. Hold on, guys. It'll change my life. <laughs> <laughs> What about you, more? Um, mostly, I'm just transferring into new materials. I'm working on um, like leather harnesses, Ooh, um, nice. leather Ooh. harnesses, some metal work. Um, and since I have a broken ankle right now, I'm spending a lot of time on my writing. I'm trying to get a that's good together. I'm doing a little writing too. I'm working on a book of the hundred most famous paintings done badly. Cool. So I'm recreating the hundred most famous paintings and very low effort in my like procreate, <laughs> like really low effort and like kind of dumb looking on purpose. Uh-huh. And then I'm gonna like write a little bit interesting factoids about that and try to self publish it. So. <laughs> We'll see how that goes. Did you say you're making a book too? Um, yeah, actually. I, um, I'm just taking years and years and years worth of kind of writing and trying to kind of synthesize it Ooh. in some form where I'm kind of taking the cutouts and the drawings and the writing and like putting them together in some yes. kind of way. It's yes. something I've been putting off for a long time and things that put off, they just kind of dog you. They so. just like chase yeah. you around and make you end up in a boot. <laughs> it's true. And so now I'm doing end a lot in of a boot. I'm going to steal that. That's funny. End up in a boot. Yeah. And I if you don't that, make like, me, I'm going to put you in the boot. I, know. <laughs> I don't know. I think that like whenever you have, um, I don't know, whenever something stops you like that, it's always an opportunity to do something else. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. Doing. Well, thank you so much for joining Thanks, us. It's been an amazing oh, conversation. Yeah, I love it. yeah have come. you're welcome back anytime. And we'll see you next time. Cool. Next time. Bye. Bye. <laughs>